Well, hello everyone, Holiday Wither here, and welcome, welcome back to another episode of 80 Days. In the last episode, we set out on our journey in our 80 day quest, and we're currently on day four in Vienna, and we were just about to depart, if I was correct. Though, if we go back to the depart menu, you'll notice if we click on Vienna, we have a thing that says if you stay here, you will actually see the army setting out. So, I'm going to pass the night here, and I want to see what the army is that they were talking about. We found a room in the newly opened Hotel Imperial in a suite built for Duke Philip of Württemberg's misadvertent. The view along the Risterbait was impressive, or there was a delightful chamber group playing in the lobby. I'm going to say that. So once Monsieur Fogg was seen to, I took myself downstairs, settled down with Cognac, and enjoyed the gentle music. After an hour or so, the group of men in fine dress came in and began making an unconsciousable noise at the bar. I could no longer hear the music, so I retired. I went to ask them to be quiet. I listened on to their banter. I'm going to ask them to be quiet. And they slapped me on the back and invited me to sit. How does it feel, one demanded, to be in Vienna on the eve of the greatness? What do you mean? She is surely great already, or I shrug. I think they're talking about the revolution that's going to happen tomorrow, but I'm going to say she is surely great already. I replied, a touch psychopathically. We will soon be greater, replied the man, gesturing his belly as though to show himself growing fatter. It seemed these men were local councillors who had been supervising a large movement of troops towards the train station, destined for Belridge, and then Istanbul. But I thought the line was not completed. You are planning an invasion. I left them wagging their tongues to talk. You are planning an invasion, I declared in amazement. One man shrugged. You might say that, I said. We are taking what is rightfully ours. I did not say much longer, conversation quickly turned in mistresses and musicianship, and so I slipped away. But we have a new route discovered. Hmm. So we can go to Istanbul. So let me actually depart. Can we go to Istanbul? That's what I want to see. Arrived on Monday. And today is Saturday. Well, let's go to the market. We can buy a music box, a monkey wrench, a wind scarf. You know, I'm going to buy a monkey wrench because you never know what you can need. And a wind scarf just for safety. Let's buy that. And I think we're good to go. So we are going to go to the hotel once more. And we're going to wait till Monday. Now, this might be a bad choice, but... I think it'll be fine. With what remained of the day, I darched the collars of our shirts. I helped the kitchen staff to clean. I went out to explore a little bit. Let's go out to explore. And succeeded only in having my pockets picked to the tune of 24 pounds. You're joking. Well, we were apparently robbed. Okay, now let's sleep again. Pass the night here. And it's now Monday. As night fell, I washed and hung our linen. I spent a while talking to the hot liar. I'm going to hang our linen. To ensure everything was shape, ship shape for our inevitable departure. And now we can depart, right? Well, we might as well go because if we don't leave now, we won't get anywhere. Viennese military transport. Four suitcases, uncomfortable conditions. This looks like a bothersome experience, but the traveling cloak from our gentleman's traveling set should soften things a bit. Well, let's go, because we have nothing else to do. We approached the train station with our bags. As boldly or as secretly as we could. I'm going to say as boldly, because we don't have anything to hide. Intending to brazen out our presence by means which my master referred to as his universal passport, by which he did not mean my good self. It was a mad plan, of course. We were stopped at the very first barrier by a guard wielding a gilded flute, just like her dancer. The platform is closed, the officer reported. You are lost. We are here on instruction from the Kaiser. We need not have noticed that we are here. You need we are in here from instructions from the Kaiser. I lied stridently. You are to let us board the train. The soldier looked surprised. There are no passengers aboard the train. Nothing but freight. We know all about your freight. You are mistaken. There are to be two passengers. And we are in two error. You are mistaken. There are supposed to be two passengers. The soldier hesitated. Traveling with soldiers. It is not safe. We will take our chances, I insisted. 
The soldier shook his head. I cannot take the risk that you gentlemen are spies, he said. He was, I think, a good man underneath that terrible uniform. So please, people are watching. And in a louder voice, he declared, What are you doing here? Oh boy, I took one last chance and held out my open wallet. Well, let's speak with money. The man thought for a moment, then snatched 200 pound notes. Very well then, he stood aside. I, for one, will be glad to know there is at least one solo board. Now hurry up before someone sees. With that, he stood aside and we clambered up to the train. There was plenty of space, the mechanical soldiers were stacked in the corridors, but the compartments were all empty. We chose one just as the whistle blew, and we headed off for Belgrade. Your funds have gone down by a fair amount. Well, yeah, we lost 200 pounds, so I guess we're in pounds, now I know what money currency we have. So now I'm gonna converse. What is your wish, master? What about our health? How are you feeling, Munster? I am in roaring health, but we must make haste. Journey? How's our progress? Day seven, I believe. Early days. Very good. And now with that, we just passed through Budapest and now in Belgrade. It may have been hard to believe, but the journey was uneventful. There was, after all, no one else aboard the train. I did not venture outside the compartment. I looked briefly into the corridor but was unable to find the courage to stay long. Mechanical men lay piled to the ceiling, and they jostled and rolled as the train clattered along. Eyelids flickered. Hands twitched. I dashed back inside the compartment. I mean, I would if I saw a bunch of weird mechanical soldiers. Do you really believe we are the only people on board? What will we do when we reach the Belgrade? I mean, that's just stating the obvious. Let's just talk about when we reach Belgrade. I demanded of my master. Disembark, I should think, he replied. We will be a few hundred miles further on, and then hopefully within reach of Istanbul or Greece. With that, he returned his attention to the newspaper, and I took to staring out the window and not back inside the train. We have strengthened our relationships with Monsieur Fogg. And here we go, Belgrade. And our health seemed to go bound by one. Well, let's plan, shall we? We have Istanbul, which seems to be the only area to go. So, let us hotel. Let us hotel, yes. Let us hotel. When our train arrived at Belgrade, no one came to meet. We stopped and sat there, cooling down in the still night air. You know, let's leap aboard it. We slept aboard since it seemed the wise thing to do. Outside the window, nothing in the city stirred. Everything was dark and unnaturally still. Even my master seemed to sense something amiss. Where are the people, monsieur? I asked. More to the point, he replied. Where are the bodies? I know no weapon which destroys only people and leaves buildings intact. I cannot say either of us slept well that night. Well, let's depart. To Istanbul. And our gentleman set should help us, so let's set out. And what can we do? We were woken with a jolt the next morning. The train had begun to move. We were settling off with our horribly silent cargo for the next more dangerous leg of the journey. The trip to Istanbul. Well, let's converse, because conversing's always good. Uh, what about the journey? Are we on track, do you think? We have barely begun. Money. How are our funds? We are quite comfortable. Well, I hope so. Oh, we quickly have arrived at Istanbul. There was still no one else aboard, so... We could do nothing to pass the time. I went to investigate the soldiers in the corridor. Speculated on what would be waiting for us. Well, let's speculate. It was surely unlike that we could travel right into the heart of his stample, even if we were using the lines built for the Orient Express. There must rather be a secret depot where the soldiers would be stockpiled. It would quickly become clear we had no way of knowing whether we were bound. Eh, I'm gonna say that. With the only overhead rumor and gossip from Vienna to provide us clues, the day wore on and night fell and the glittering ribbon of the Bosphorus moved into view. We approached Sereki Station, and then passed it by. Finally, we came to a halt in the dark and gloomy warehouse. We waited to see what would happen next, and finally the doors of the warehouse opened. A few figures entered, carrying lamps. They began to look through the train. Hmm. Well, to be safe, I'm going to introduce ourselves, striding up and each putting out a hand to shake. The figures raised weapons, but when they saw us clearly, a valet. Struggling under the weight of several cases, and a gentleman looking somewhat deprived of sleep, they laughed. How have you ended up here? One of the women demanded. 
I related our story and the youngest of the group snorted in amusement. A spy would have fabricated a less outlandish tale, he remarked. It must be truth. The woman who had spoken made a gesture to the others and lowered their weapons. Clearly, she was the one in charge. Monsieur Fogg caught my arm and pointed out the copper lily pins glittering on their clothing. You are artificers. What are you doing with these creatures? We should leave you to your business. Let's say they are artificers, I exclaimed. You are speaking with the counselor Gubenhauer bin Salle. One of the younger men interjected, she is no mere artificer. Thank you, Abdel. The counselor replied, voice heavy with irony. Let us refrain from giving these interlopers our addresses as well. So then, this is a serious matter. It is war, the counselor agreed. These soldiers were the first wave of an invasion force sent to Istanbul, but our agent diverted them here for us to study. Will you disable them? If we cannot destroy them, she agreed, the Austro-Hungarians have made their creations far too perfect. How could she say such a thing? I cannot help admire them myself. Well, I guess that as well. They were perfectly honed blades, killing machines that were all edge and purity of purpose. Now, she raised her voice, it is time you leave us to our work. And so we stepped out, blinking, into the bustling streets of Istanbul, a site of unexpected poignancy after the desolation of Belgrade. Relationships have strengthened with fog. Oh, we still have not arrived, and now we arrive. Seems we can complete our dusty road gear here for protection against dust and fumes. We'll have to sleep and explore in the morning. Okay. We'll pass the night here, considering there's nothing else to do. And I woke this morning in the silks of an Ottoman harem girl. Worse yet, I was in a forbidden woman's apartment of Topik Palace. I had no memory of the previous night, at least none I wished to record, but quickly ascertained to the peril of my position. Having no claim to Ottoman royalty, it was not just my master's wager at stake. Men were forbidden here, and the punishment was liable to the most severe. There was only one option to keep my head down and run. After some confusion, shouting and dashing about, I took a brief but refreshing swim in the Bosphorus. I scaled one of the outer walls using a palm tree. And despite some regrettable wear to my dashing silks, I arrived outside the wall in one piece. I found Monsieur Fogg reading a newspaper, and he seemed to be one step ahead of me. Why I was the only one in the woman's chamber, I have no idea, but I don't want to question it as well. He looked up and blushed a most violent shade of red as he took in my attire, setting his cup down with uncharitable force. I gave my master a much abbreviated account of my adventures, and yet somehow the matter quietly dropped. Sometimes, I confess I do admire the English. And now we are zestful. I thought we were already zestful, but I guess not. So it opens at 7 p.m. The harem silk should fetch a good price in high. We should decide to sell them. The harem silk, okay. Wait about a few more seconds, and then the market should open. The harem silk should be good. And air sickness pills, driving goggles, part one of the dusty set, and what's the other part of the set? Do I already have it? Is this part of- oh, we already have it. So let's get the driving goggles. And do we want to get a railroad whistle? I don't think we do. I'm going to be safe, so I think we're okay. And I think we can explore. Our dusty, completed dusty road gear should protect us against dust and fumes and help us negotiate times of dirt road journeys. Oh, let's explore. And we have some new routes discovered. A lot of new routes, to be honest. Man, I'm actually gonna go for that one. The one that's out in the ocean. I found myself in the historic quarters of Sultan Hamet in the shadows of the glorious minarets of the Blue Mosque. I had some hours before I had to return to Monsieur Fogg, and was finding myself attracted to some entertaining attention in my flashing silks. The streets are full of magnificent sights. Historic plate palaces or bright marbled mosques? I'm gonna say historic palaces with rambling manicured gardens, bright gold curtain carriages drawn by mechanical horses, enabled in scarlet and purple, and a mob gathering on a street corner. Being Parisian, I had a keen sense for a riot and tried to extricate myself quickly, ask someone to explain their grievance. Uh, it's a riot. I don't want to get myself involved in that because we do not have a weapon. 
so I'm going to try to extraviate myself quickly. Hampered by the encumbrance of my flowing silk costume, I stumbled only to be gently brightened by a pleasant-faced young medical student. Be careful, sister, he cautioned me. The path to liberty is a treacherous one. I pulled my veil even more securely around my face from the, as the crowd surged forward, shouting slogans in Arabic and English, and even some well-worn phrases stolen directly from the French Revolution. I, spun, I spotted an empty side street and took my chance. Ducking in, I waited till the crowd passed, but I was soon not alone. The student had followed my lead. Come no closer, I warned him, raising my fists. He raised his hands. I mean you ha no harm, sister. Please. But if you only listen, I think you will see our cause is just. <sighs> Fine. I feel like he's gonna be persistent, so I'm gonna have him say, I let him lead the way. I unclenched my knuckles and let him lead the way, and soon enough we were sitting at a nearby cafe, thronged with young, modern-minded men and women, sipping coffee and discussing politics. I was still wearing silk, so performed the complex negotiation between veil and coffee cup. Well, if we can get some negotiations and get some more paths opened, that would be nice. Istanbul is not safe for those who seek liberty, he told me seriously. I'm escaping to Beirut tonight by hot air balloon. The pilot is sympathetic to our cause. You would be welcome to join us, sister. I asked how long the journey would take, and he nodded. Two or three days, I think, departing on the winds. I promised him I would consider it before taking my leave. And that should open up a new path, correct? You can manage another case, can't you, Passporte? No, I think we're fine. But what we are going to do is depart for Baruch. Because, even though it might do a lot of damage on our health, we do have the gear, correct? Rough skies and cold weather. This promises to be a wearisome experience, but from the traveling cloak from our gentleman's traveler set, we should be of some assistance. So I'm gonna go. On the Rosier Balloon. We met the zealous young medical student on the outskirts of the city just before midnight. I maintained my female disguise. I'm gonna keep it up just so we can keep going. Concerned that we should not miss the chance to leave despite Monster's Fog. Clear concerns. The student greeted me with warmth, but gave my master a dark look. But the awkward moment did not last. A shout from above interrupted our tableau. A Razier hybrid balloon loomed several hundred feet in the air, visible only as a patch of startledness in the night sky. Then a small figure leaned out of the suspended car and threw a flimsy silk rope ladder over the side. I seized it with enthusiasm and caring little for modesty, I clambered aboard. With a roar of fire from the propane burners, we began our journey. And our relationships might have deteriorated a bit, but we are now courageous. They're quite the flamboyant type, I see. Indeed. The first day was brief and majestic as we sailed up and across the ocean. Why do we head this way, I demanded. We have to catch the thermals, the student replied. Really, Passporte, how long will you maintain that ridiculous outfit? What? Oh, so apparently we can groom fog. And that will help him feel better. I must ask you something, the medical student whispered. At the time, Monsieur Fogg was above, tending to the necessary, and the pilot fiddling intently with the propane burner. I think I know what he's going to talk about, so I braced myself. Yes? Is Mr. Fogg your, um, close companion? I feared the poor boy was about to make a fool of himself, and I gently touched his arm. Do not trouble yourself over me, I advised him. He looked away, then seized my hand. He does not treat you as an equal. He told me passionately. Sister, he treats you like... Like... A servant? Yes, he agreed sorrowfully. A horrible lurch of the bloom put pay to our debate. The young student caught me in his arms as I stumbled. But poor Monsieur Fogg fell unceremoniously in the lower cabin for the upper car. He gave me the strangest look from the supine position, but said nothing. I am on fine form, but we must make haste. Indeed. And thankfully, we are arriving to Beirut. And I didn't get the second to groom Fogg. So, we passed the mountain island of Cyprus, leased to the British Empire by the Ottomans only a few years before. Across a short stretch of sea lay our destination. The mood was rather tense between the young medical student Monsieur Fogg, who anticipated seemingly to have matured from general to quite specific. The balloon began to descend rapidly. I closed my arm and braced for the crash, knowing our journey had been going in this direction. But when I opened them again, the busy harbor of Beirut loomed in front of us. 
thronged by the multicolored sails of trade ships from all corners of the world. Your character is now zestful. And we should now arrive in Barut. Yeah, we'll have to explore Barut to find an onward journey. But, ladies and gentlemen, with arriving in Barut, I think I'm going to end this episode off here. So, this is Holiday Withers signing off. Hope you enjoyed another episode of 80 Days. And if you have, make sure to hit that like button, and I will see you guys in the next episode. Have a nice day!